Only the toughest among us challenge the powerful waters of the Northwest. And still, the Seattle-based Alaskan fishing fleet remains an integral part of our economy here in Washington. So every year, those fishermen go out and test their luck against nature's fury. I'm Gabe Cohen, and tonight we'll go to Alaska for an inside look at those daring fishermen and the remarkable men and women challenged with keeping them safe, riding those white and orange helicopters of the U.S. Coast Guard, carrying an angel in the doorway. It's 5 a.m. in Kodiak, Alaska. Calm water flows into St. Paul Harbor where only a few fishing vessels still sit idle. Most are out on the open sea for salmon season. On this peaceful morning, the crew of the Laguna Star prepares to join the others. Captain Tim Gossett will guide his crew into the Alaska Gulf for weeks at a time. That's how this industry works. Every season they search for a different fish, but the goal is the same. A big catch means a big payday. Tens of thousands of dollars at stake for each crew member. There's always the risk reward thing that makes you, you know, maybe take a little bit more of a chance. There's also the harsh reality with what happened last week. Sitting in a salvage yard is another Kodiak fishing vessel, the Miss Destiny, just seven days after a wave capsized it not far from home. Two deckhands, a brother and sister, drowned inside the boat. 18-year-old Joshua wanted to be a doctor to help others. 22-year-old Abigail loved adventure. A wreath now hangs for them in Kodiak's town center. I hate to say it, it's part of it, you know, it's, but yeah, don't turn your back on Mother Nature. On Alaska's waters, conditions can turn ugly quickly, and if something goes wrong, often a crew is all alone. Every fisherman knows the risk, some better than others. Ain't nobody different from the next person out on that water because it's the water's choice, not ours. I already got it, Captain. Mike Farnsworth works on the Laguna Star now. Yes, I one day. But three years ago, he was on another boat in the Bering Sea when the stove caught fire in the dead of night and smoke suddenly filled the vessel. Just remember hell is seen in my face, just seeing the sign of hell. It scared the shit out of me. I think I had to make the decision of do I jump off the boat or not? He did jump with his crew as the boat sank, and there they floated, waiting for what Mike thought was inevitable. I'm dead. I'm dead. I was just holding on to Oli and holding on to Chris, and we are just stuck like this all together. We just stayed in a bunch, and I, the whole time I was like, we're not going to survive. We're going to die. We're going to die. But as darkness consumed him, a faint sound suddenly echoed over the ocean. Then something appeared on the horizon. My savior, <laughs> oh, like almighty. Their last hope. I can't believe they found me. I can't believe they're here. Ten miles outside Kodiak, surrounded by rolling mountains that end at the sea, sits a military base decorated for U.S. Coast Guard Alaska. Their biggest role in this region launches from two hangars on the base's edge. It's a lifeline known as search and rescue. Every time that we get launched on search and rescue, we are the last line to rescue these people. Because there's nobody else, there's no other game in town. Coast Guard search and rescue is the main medevac in the last frontier, pulling people from remote areas and villages to get them higher care. Medical emergencies across the state can force their helicopters to launch. But their urgent calls often come from the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, where thousands of fishing crews spend months at work in isolation. Forward and right. If something goes wrong, Coast Guard Alaska is often their only shot at survival. It's a dangerous, dangerous job. So it's our job to go out there and make sure that when they do get in trouble, we do our best to help them. Just how much area does your team have to cover? Okay, so we have about three and a half million square miles. And salute. Captain Mark Morin oversees search and rescue. Their team flies all the way to Russian water and north to the Arctic. Well, on some of the search and rescue cases that we fly, it's the equivalent of flying from Maine to Florida to get on scene. 
Time is of the essence. So when a call comes into their operations center. And then we have our assets already on the board. The captain expects a plan and wheels up in less than 30 minutes. It's a well choreographed operation. You know, your mission is to save somebody else's life. It's, it's a challenge, though. Conditions we have to go out there and to find, you know, a person or a fishing boat in the vastness of Alaska. The weather in Alaska poses a big problem, especially in the winter. That's a beautiful sight, man! When heavy storms and thick fog make search and rescue difficult and dangerous for the Coast Guard. There's ceilings, there's icing, there's turbulence. So your ability of where you can fly gets very limited. You know, you only have six hours of daylight, so a lot of the search and rescue cases that you're flying in up here are under the cover of darkness. Once you get on scene, just because you have a latitude and longitude of that previous distress call, that debris field, that raft, that vessel will have definitely moved. When the Coast Guard searches for a fisherman or a boat, rescuers may scan the surface of the sea for hours at a time, using line of sight as well as radars and cameras built into their helicopters. This is our forward-looking infrared, which also has a couple of other capabilities, but that allows us to see differences in heat signatures out on the water. So if somebody sees something, they say, mark, 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 we note the position, and then we safely transition to a point where we can go fly over that again and see if it's what we were looking for. Once they find it, the team works quickly. That might mean dropping a rescue swimmer into frigid water to fight through sea swells and pull someone from the ocean's grip. The rescue swimmer is the one person who gets to go out there and, and bring people back. You, you end up with a pretty uh, dangerous environment that we have to operate in uh, pretty much daily. Communication is key out there, and it's the flight mechanic's responsibility. Survivor inside cabin. They run the hoist and direct the pilot throughout a rescue. Making sure we're not going to hit anything and also focusing on the swimmer, making sure that they stay in sight and trying to get that device safely and as quickly as I can to them. If all goes right, the mechanic ultimately pulls someone in and the team flies them out. Coast Guard Alaska has saved hundreds of fishermen over the years. That's somebody's loved one. No different than I would want somebody looking for us if we were stuck out on the water. There is nobody else after us. So they fly into danger with optimism, no matter the odds. We want to go out we want to save everybody. But unfortunately, time distance uh, doesn't always allow us to do that. Anchored in the heart of Kodiak is a collection of names connected by fate. These are fishermen who never came home. Then they'd read the next name and we'd ring it again. Marty Owen was Kodiak's harbor master for two decades. Oh, I know all these guys on the big valley here. He comes here to clear his mind sometimes. His eyes drift, but always stop on the same plate. Jason and Lucy Greer were good friends of mine. In 1999, Jason and Lucy Greer ran a small boat with just one crew member, a teenage boy. During a July storm, a wave crashed over their stern and flooded the skiff. As Marty remembers, Jason and Lucy quickly realized their vessel couldn't hold all three of them. So the couple made a difficult choice. They left the boat to save that young man. But Jason and Lucy basically gave their life so that he could survive. And it was be touching. So many similar stories hide in this sea of names, but this industry built Kodiak. We exist because people catch fish and, and sell them. So the work goes on. I keep saying I'm going to retire, but it's kind of hard to do. At 67 years old, Jeff Allen estimates he's pulled a few million crab pots from the water. Well, I still love it. As soon as I as soon as I don't like it anymore, I quit, man. I, it's not an easy way to make a living. Right now, he's docked to repair his boat and clear some of the rust left on its steel frame from an ocean beating. It's a brutal cycle to keep these boats safe. I could chip on this little spot here for about two hours, and maybe I'd get the rust out to a point where then it would work. But, you know, it would take me, I wouldn't be able to go fishing if all I had to do was just keep the boat up as much as I can. As the skipper of the Chiniac, safety is his top priority. But sometimes the big catch is swimming in rough water beneath ugly weather. Everybody who's ever fished for a while has gotten into situations they didn't want to be in. And I've had a lot of friends and fish, fellow fishermen and gone down, you know. And I think the main difference between those of us who are still around and them is just almost kind of luck. 
But the Coast Guard wants to take luck out of the equation, at least as much as possible. Skipper Peter Longrich shows off the Gumby suits on his boat, the Shoe Yak. It's like a big uh, buoyant suit and it's made out of real thick neoprene so you can survive in the cold water for over 24 hours. And on the bridge, an EPIRB hangs. It's an emergency beacon. So this will send a signal to a satellite and give you your uh, vessel name, who it is, where it is. Coast Guard Alaska has been pushing these types of safety standards on the fishing industry since the late 1980s. They give you a sheet and there's about 50 different items on there want, they want to see. You know, if you didn't have a Coast Guard, people will get, uh, they would relax and they would overlook things. And the emphasis has worked. Fishing deaths are trending way down in Alaska. And in 2015, this industry marked its first 12 month span with zero commercial fishermen killed at sea. But since then, more names have been etched into memorials. This year, 10 fishermen died on Alaska's water. It's a dangerous way to make a living. And each tragedy creates a ripple, one of which 10 months ago carried all the way to Seattle. Sometimes even a simple dream captures a child's heart. And like a riptide, it overpowers anything else. Kai. This little boy was Kai Hammock. The ocean called to him. As a kid, all he wanted was to own a fishing boat and take up his father's trade. His name is Kai. It's, it's a Polynesian name meaning ocean, blue. It made me extremely proud. At 22, Kai joined a renowned crew on a boat based out of Seattle. He started crabbing in the Bering Sea, despite his mother's fear. I said, please don't. I don't want you to go. I said my, my words to him, I don't want to bury you before me. Oh, mom, it'll be okay. Kai never worried given the skills and experience of the five fishermen around him, the crew of the destination. Hi, everyone. A crab boat from Seattle vanishes in the Bering Sea. In the early hours of February 11, 2017, the destination's emergency beacon went off two miles northwest of Alaska's St. George Island, launching an urgent mission in the Bering Sea. We got underway immediately. About 50 miles out, we launched. It was nighttime. The conditions were not that great. I remember there was there was snow and low ceilings. The vessel was nowhere to be seen. Coast Guard crews combed thousands of miles of icy water and found nothing more than debris. But they kept searching as the hammocks waited. We would have probably gone crazy without them. They were the ones that were holding our hands. We put about everything we had to find that ship. I just knew in my heart as a mother that it's not going to be found. After three days, the Coast Guard called off the search. Jeff Hathaway, Larry O'Grady, Ray Vinkler, Charles Jones, Derek Seibold, and Kai Hammock were lost at sea. There's Kai boy. The destination used to dock here at Fisherman's Terminal in Seattle. It's a sacred place to Tom and Judy Hammock. To be close to Kai is, in a physical sense, is to be close to the water. Kai's name now hangs alongside his crew. <sighs> whose families are also grieving. It's tough with everything going on to try to find some peace. Dylan Hatfield's brother, Derek, was on the destination, and Dylan himself fished with the crew for years. When you lose somebody and they're lost at sea, it's a different, it's a different grieving process. You don't have closure. You don't have a body to bury. I love the ocean and I always will. To think about not going back out breaks my heart. But Dylan wouldn't be landlocked. So last summer, he boarded another boat with his brother in his heart. I think he would want me to go back out. <laughs> it's common among these fishermen, that riptide pulling them back to the water again and again. There's a secret that fishermen don't talk about, but each one of us know it. Anybody that's taken sea spray in the face, anybody that's gone through 15 to 18 foot waves, and you see that water freeze on the back deck, on pots. You know that secret is, it could be any one of us at any time. Surprise events! But try telling that to a dreamer whose heart belongs to the sea. If I took you, in a room, and I turn off all the lights, made you close your eyes. 
and then I told you to hold your breath. Then I put you in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, and told you to rescue somebody. That's what you have to do. You have to be prepared to do that. Few choose this mission, even within the Coast Guard, to come to Kodiak and tussle with Alaska's terrain. And those who do respect it. That's what we train, really. Tick -tock, tick -tock, boys. Tick -tock. Before they dive into sea swells, rescue swimmers build their skills twice a week in this Coast Guard pool, simulating missions to ensure they can carry 30 pounds of equipment and a person if need be. Physical fitness of my rescue swimmers is probably unlike any other unit. This is our rescue basket. This is our primary means of recovery for survivors. And low check complete, storm is going down. Rescue swimmers are often lowered into the water, but in urgent moments, they'll free fall from the helicopter. The first few uh, free falls that you do as a rescue swimmer are kind of surreal. You know, you're sitting at the edge of a, a helicopter about to jump in an ocean and and in the moment, the training kicks in and you don't really realize what happens till maybe, you know, while you're uh, falling through the air or, or after the fact. Intense training guides Coast Guard pilots as well. Alaska is never their first assignment, and they spend year one just learning the landscape before they're allowed to command a mission. If they're having challenges in the lower 48, they don't need to be coming up here. And taking a load. In Alaska, the scale and conditions demand something extra from those who do accept this assignment. It's your mental dexterity that holds you here, you know? It's your ability to hold on when everything else is not right. Josh is working as a survivor in the back. The minute you go out there uh, unprepared for the, the environment, that's when you get in trouble. And unfortunately, that's, a lot of times that's, that's when people perish. The danger is part of what bonds them. <laughs> Rescue swimmer Thomas Bolin reminded his crew during his retirement ceremony. Do not forget those who went before you or even died representing those wings you so proudly wear today. I'm going to miss your can-do attitude, your bravery, brotherhood, and your selfish willingness to risk your life for someone that you don't even know. Saving a life is often impossible. That's the harsh reality reinforced by the destination and the misdestiny. No one enjoys those days, but I, I guess in the end, you got to feel that you're bringing closure to a family. That's part of search and rescue. But what pulls this crew back to their helicopters is the chance to save a life on the next flight. That is the best perk of this job. It's bigger than you know, winning the Super Bowl. I mean, it's just like you've made a huge impact on somebody's life. They rarely hear from them again, but occasionally something special happens, like when this letter arrived at the hangar in 2013 from a man they saved one week earlier. The dark, rocky shore was a very cold, wet, and lonely place, he wrote. I know what you do has meaning. It certainly does for me. I really wish I could find better words to say this, but thank you again for my life and for your service. That letter still hangs on rescue swimmer Jonathan Kresge's wall. Swimmers in the water, swimmers away, swimmers okay. Put now it's a daily reminder of what it really means when they bring someone home. It's pretty much un indescribable. I mean, it's a feeling that you really, you really get at your core. You know, you just know that, that uh, you've done good. Time passes free of urgency in Linda and Stephen Saddam's home. Not every minute matters amidst simple pleasures like a newspaper and a glass of wine. And they consider this quiet life a gift, given how close they came to losing it on a day when every second counted. It gives you a whole different perspective of life. On September 9, 2016, the Saddams boarded a float plane from Kodiak to Amok Island, less than 100 miles away. They made it 40, but over Uganic Lake, something went wrong. The pilot banked, then the plane stalled. And it was just like that, the nose just fell. And we're just going straight down. Those few seconds tumbling toward the earth are the last Linda remembers. I was doing the Lord's Prayer and I was preparing myself and I was gone. Direct impact mangled the plane and stopped the propeller. Only Stephen opened his eyes. And it was just deadly silence, just the most silence you can ever hear. And I looked at my hands and I said, I looked at this, I said, oh, I made it. 
With water at his waist, he looked back. Linda was missing. The pilot was unconscious but alive. Stephen's teeth were throbbing. His body didn't know where to send the pain. He sat back and calmed himself. Then he reached for his seatbelt, which had ripped into his stomach. Right when I was released my seatbelt, I seen this brown swirl come to the surface. And I looked at it and realized it was Linda's hair. And I grabbed her hair and yanked her up like this. And I didn't quite have her all the way up. And so I had to drop her and I grabbed her again and by the, right by the top of her head, and I yanked her all the way up out of there, and in that time, it just expanded her lungs. She just, she just took a big deep breath, go, <gasps> like that, and then she came to, and, you know, and that's when I started telling her not, you know, she's not going to die on me. Linda had been underwater close to seven minutes. She had a stroke and could barely breathe. She needed help. A boat reached them. Good Samaritans. Stephen knew they had one hope. I said, you, somebody call the Coast Guard. 90 minutes later, search and rescue crews were overhead and dropped swimmers to the broken trio. Trying to bring them from their plane crash site to the beach, get them stabilized on litters um, and packaged with oxygen uh, into the back of the plane and then transported back to Kodiak. So it was very chaotic. There was a lot going on. The medics wrapped them up and lifted them from isolation. They raced to Kodiak where the Saddams spent 70 days in the hospital. Stephen had a shattered femur, a fractured pelvis, and he nearly lost his leg. Linda had 27 broken bones and brain trauma, but somehow they were alive. Believe me, I had that 70 days in the hospital to think about every second. I never once thought I was going to die, you know, going down. You know, and I try to get around that, you know, why, why I even thought that, you know. And uh, if I hadn't, if I would have sat there and, you know, crashed, not did anything, we'd probably all be gone. The couple's slow recovery isn't over. Linda still has some neurological issues, but she's getting stronger every day. I'd rather be six feet above ground than six feet underground. They have a new puppy, Amux Angel, named for their dog who died in the crash. It was between me or her. I had to let go of her so I could brace myself. She may not remember much, but she'll never forget what the Coast Guard did. If they weren't there, I wouldn't be alive. They basically call me a miracle. A miracle. Some would say that. Others just call it a day's work. It definitely warms my heart because that's the reason I joined the Coast Guard. We appreciate them. We deeply appreciate them. Billy Myers once viewed this glistening sea differently, but Alaska's water swallowed his innocence long ago. You have to respect it, definitely. It's some power greater than us. 1988, Billy's second summer fishing Alaska. He was the deck boss of a longlining crew hunting black cod deep in the Gulf. Miles out, his crew hit a storm, the biggest Billy has seen to this day. And the engineer came up and said that we had some really major problems. And um, we had snapped some bolts on a coupling that connected our shaft to our prop. And um, it was major. We were dead in the water. Dead in the water. That means no motor and no control. They were stranded, twisting and turning at Mother Nature's mercy. We would have ended up on some beach somewhere, or we would have got caught by the wrong wave and, and capsized. They radioed the Coast Guard, who told them to hold tight. They would come, but it would take time. It was like kind of like a miracle. You know, you're like, wow, you know, finally there's hope. So for five days, Billy and the crew kept faith as they rode stormy swells across the Gulf, knowing the next wave might sink them. I said a lot of prayers. I really did. And when we saw the cutter on the radar, it was just like, it was like the cavalry coming over the hill, you know? And we were surrounded by the enemy, which was the seas. The Coast Guard arrived and towed them home. This time, the enemy was defeated. We're really lucky to have a good Coast Guard, that's for sure. Without that sort of uh, element there, it would, it would be no hope. 
Months later, Billy was on the open sea again. You live to fish, fish to live. That's life as an Alaska fisherman, knowing the enemy always looms, but sailing into a fight anyway. It's part of your job. If you can't handle that, I mean, you don't belong on the water. Perhaps more than any other, bravery is the defining trait of U.S. Coast Guard Alaska's search and rescue crew. And we look for them and we find them before we rescue them. Which is why it's no surprise eight-year-old Andrew Bishop chose this mission. Andrew was born with schizencephaly, a neurological defect. He went straight into foster care. And the neurologist was like, don't take him. He's going to be just so hard, so much hard work. We truly felt um, it was a blessing from God. TJ and Stephanie Bishop adopted Andrew, and as a family, they've pushed forward. Andrew is nonverbal and non-mobile, but he's never let it hold him back. He plays sports, he swims with dolphins. He is up for everything and ready for the next adventure. Go! It's only fitting his favorite movie is The Guardian. So when the Make-A-Wish Foundation offered to fulfill Andrew's wildest dream, he knew what he wanted. I'm like, really? And that's pretty much how this thing took off. Andrew asked to come to Kodiak and become a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. What went through your mind? Got to do something good. Put that on like that. How's that look? Huh? <laughs> Day one in Kodiak begins at a Coast Guard pool. Good luck today. It's hard training. I don't know you can do it, buddy. Andrew will learn how to save lives in ocean swells. Rescue swimmer Kaola Marfil leads their eager recruit through the drills. We're going to do one more of those, and then it's time to rescue people. Andrew sets the pace, <laughs> unfazed by the chaos around him. Kick, kick. Look at you. You're so fast. Kick fast. Kick fast. He insists on swimming extra laps. Oof, that blew my mind away. I expected him to have fun, but he did not stop. That's how you earn a spot in this unit. One, two, three. Yeah. Got to smile for these pictures, all right? Andrew Bishop. After the pool, Andrew receives his fins. Way to go, buddy. He's officially rescue swimmer 946.5. Let's go check this one out, see how you like it. You ready to do it? And from there, his search and rescue team wants to show him the equipment. And they control how the plane flies. Kayola and Cody Dickey are trained to meet people on their worst day. Here we go. But today, they gently guide Andrew through one of his best. Uh, you having a good time? Good. That brings tears to your eyes. All right, you ready to rock and roll? You ask him anything, he's he's nodding his head yes, smiling, and he wants to. He just wants to go and do it. The next morning, fun and games end. Make sure that we have all our flares. Because Andrew is now on duty, and the wait is short-lived. <laughs> oh, that's SAR alarm. We gotta get ready. Let's go fly. We gotta save some people. Andrew and his team make their way to the helicopter for his first rescue. You ready? They board and then they soar. Eight miles away, they drop a line to an injured man below. Don't worry, it's just rescue swimmer Joel Sayers. They pull him in and head home, where a crowd is waiting. There he is! Attitude equals altitude, and he's got a great attitude. As Andrew lands, Coast Guard commanders welcome their rescue swimmer home. This case, right, good ones. Nice job, guys. He's proud. I was proud. That was awesome. That was hey, cool. Probably one of the best moments of my career. <laughs> I just want him to go with a full heart. Hey, hey. You saved him? Yes, he did. Andrew proudly tells his mom what happened in the sky. His team saved a life. Yeah. Um, and lifted several more along the way. Been pretty mind blowing. Um, apologize. Seeing his dreams come true is everything. One more mission accomplished in a life journey, just taking flight. I don't think we'll be able to top this. Are you ready for duty? He's got a lifetime ahead to find out. And you gotta watch out. We join the Coast Guard because we want to help. We want to save lives. I joined the Coast Guard to be the human link in the life-saving chain. Being able to be there for people on their worst day. Not many people are afforded the opportunity to, to be able to do what we do. and. Uh, and I love it every day.
The Coast Guard's investigation into the sinking of the destination continues to this day. I'm Gabe Cohen. Thanks for watching. Good night.